Okay, welcome to our one hour webinar tonight on meeting the needs of autistic pupils in our school. I'm Eveline from Awesome Training. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in the live session and thank you for watching this recording. I'm joined by Siobhan this evening. Um, Siobhan is a teacher at primary school in Wales School. Siobhan is autistic. Siobhan only found out she was autistic last year, year before. Mm -hmm. Last year. <laughs> Um, if you want to know more from Siobhan, she actually did a, um, an interview with me for Awesome Women on our YouTube channel. It's a lovely interview um, where you shared a lot of your story with us. So do have a look at that. Siobhan has, um, obviously we've been in touch for a while now. You've done every course Awesome Training offers nearly at this stage. She's like, um, and some of them I've re-listened to. <laughs> Um, and you have done, um, and you've been so kind to work with your dad over the summer to translate our school program includes into uh, Ask Gap. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that will be exciting for the Wales School. So, um, I suppose those who haven't been to something with Awesome Training before, Awesome Training is um, autistic led, and that means I'm autistic. All any of our presenters are autistic. People who design the courses and deliver training are autistic. We um, are very much in line with um, current thinking and the values of the autistic community and neuroaffirming approaches and ideas. And if you don't know that word, we try and explain a little bit of that <laughs> throughout this evening. And, you know, we are, I suppose, use the, the most current research because the most current research is backing up what the autistic people have been saying for decades, really. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about autistic children in our schools. So, I mean, we're not going to put it, it that's school, preschool, you know, up to up to college level, really. Um, we kind of have the same themes or the same problems, maybe. So we will talk about some of the problems tonight, but we're also going to talk about some of the solutions because it's not much point, really, you know, kind of just uh, giving out as much as we like it without maybe talking about what we can do. Um, mm. There are lots of things that we can do. So, um, Siobhan, I suppose we talked a few weeks ago, there was a, an article in the examiner, kind of, you know, that like autism classes are opening in schools, um, basically with, with no training for the staff. So the teachers aren't trained, the, the SNAs might not be trained, um, and kind of the repercussions on the children for that. And it was quite hard to read quite shocking, quite, well, not shocking, I suppose we'd know it, but shocking for the people. It was disturbing and it was, you know, just kind of showing everything that was wrong with the system, not individual teachers or SMAs or anything like that. Um, the problem is we have a system that's broken. It doesn't work for a lot of children. When it comes to autistic children, we have schools that have no training whatsoever or have autism training that is so outdated that it just needs to be torn up and thrown in the bin. So, you know, they're relying on ancient ideas of autistic kids who lack social skills, who don't have empathy, who um, have meltdowns because they're autistic, who don't know how to behave themselves because of autism, like really, really outdated stuff. And that's the kind of ideas that people are going in to talk, you know, to, to work with autistic children. So both those kind of ideas are situations are harmful and are damaging for autistic kids, you know, and, and it's not enjoyable for obviously people working in that environment either. So, I mean, we've kind of created this terrible environment um, needlessly um, through a lot of ignorance and, and, and misinformation, I suppose. So, um, yeah, what would you see, I suppose, Siobhan, as, as when you read that article, I suppose, what were the things that you put out of it? Let's start with that. Well, I mean, devastatingly, it was very difficult to read about the children and what was happening to the autistic children. And, you know, and in reading it, I, I was hoping that perhaps that was more extreme than in, in a lot of schools, I, I hope. Um, however, sometimes the more extreme things that are happening within our schools are the easier things to spot and see that are happening to our autistic children. Um, and there's an awful lot happening that maybe isn't as obvious to, to everybody involved. Um, I mean, all of that and it is devastating and traumatic and difficult. Um, you know, and there, it's a system where autistic children are suffering within our classrooms on a daily basis. It all points to a broken system. There's no doubt about that. The system is extremely broken. 
you know, it starts from lack of, I mean, I, I don't know what's happening within the training college. So my daughter's in fourth year in, in one of the training colleges and I, I'm not seeing that much is happening there at all. Um, I, and that's, I think that's a wasted and missed opportunity. What you said then, Evelyn, about then there are people coming on here tonight. There are people who are genuine. In fact, I, I would really love to say that the vast majority of teachers, what they are doing for our autistic children is what they think is right. Um, you know, I mean, we'd have to be able to say that. The vast majority of schools are probably doing what they think is right. And even, you know, people are coming on here tonight. Are the, to me, they're the lucky people because, I mean, I was lucky. I was guided to, to come here. And even when I found out I was autistic, I could have ended up doing the wrong type of courses. And, you know, unfortunately, these courses are available from the NCSE. There are CPV courses, there are CPD courses, there are EPV courses. Um, and before we even start doing those courses, before we even enroll for them, there are flashing massive negative messages to us about our autistic children they're getting inside us as as, as snas and teachers and principals and, and and school communities and staff and they're saying autism and negative behavior so automatically we're assuming at some kind of level well how, how conscious or subconscious i don't know but we're you know we're being told autism equals negative behavior autism and challenging behavior and so already we're looking at how do we fix our autistic children within the system? And, and, and th this is the bottom line. Our autistic children are not broken at all. The system that is supposed to be minding them and caring for them and nurturing them and making them feel safe is broken. And how do we fix all of that? That is so difficult and so um huge it's humongous and and you know it's it's massively overwhelming when you're in the system just to see how broken it is so you know um we can't fix that system right now i'd love to um and uh, you know i'd love to be 30 years younger and starting out with more time um but what, what we can do is we can look i suppose maybe tonight at why it's going wrong for, for our children our individual children and and, and all of the children um, from the point of view maybe of what's happening within the classroom then when we come in the classroom albeit through lack of you already spoke about this Evelyn the right type of knowledge about, about what we need to know and what we need to do within within our systems um you know and we talk, you talked about neuroaffirming and here here is a big big massive gap in the market a gap in the system you know I didn't know the word neurotypical and neurodivergent a year ago. I'm autistic and I didn't know this. I, I, I've teaching nearly 30 years and I, I didn't know this. So, you know, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a huge problem. And so, be, I mean, it's, it's very hard to condense all of this down, isn't it? But, but basically what's happening within our system is we're creating a neurotypical system for for. for for the typical neurotypical people. So, you know, it, it, with big classrooms, massive classes, sorry, not massive classrooms, I love massive classes. Well, with big class sizes, we've overloaded curriculum, we've pressured to get a huge amount of things done. And so, at the moment, the way to do that is to Because someone said, this is the curriculum. Like, mm. you know what I mean? When we really step back and start taking stuff apart, but I suppose I, I won't start my track of, of, of schooling and different things because I'll get sidetracked. Um, just, I suppose, yeah, to explain, when we say autistic children, their behavioral issues are not because of autism. Okay, because that's something you mentioned. Nope. I kind of want to clarify that for people who are here. Yeah. There is this misunderstanding that because a lot of autistic children have challenging behavior or behaviors mm. that you know challenge you know are disruptive or harming or whatever or don't suit a classroom people think that's autism people think this because they've been taught this people yeah. think this because there's an idea that an autistic child doesn't know how to behave themselves and has no social skills and must be taught how to so that's all kind of muddled in there okay and then what you get is people coming along and using trying to teach a child to do something thinking that they just don't know how to do it or they just need to learn the boundaries of within school or whatever when actually what you have is a highly highly distressed child what we know now is a lot of children are traumatized like literally if somebody is diagnosed autistic the diagnostic criteria includes signs of trauma okay 
which is not a nice thing to admit as an autistic person. <laughs> you know, it's really not nice for us to be telling people this stuff, but it is how it is, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of things that are called autism are signs of, of distressed human beings, basically. So if a kid is, you know, lashing out or, you know, blah, 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 or being defiant, as we say, they're coping mechanisms, basically, to a world that is not accepting them, to a world which is not accommodating them. Um, they're and not only not not only not ac accepting them. I mean that, that that's that's one thing, but not. Well, I was trying to, trying to bring this all to another level. Not only not, not not accepting them within the system, but trying to make them somebody else even. And so, if if we accepted them, we will work with what we have from a, an artistic point of view. But we're taking them even a step further. Unfortunately, through all of the things that we said and saying, well, I not only don't accept you as an autistic person and learner and a, somebody who has emotions and feelings and language and culture and all the things that autistic people have, but, I, but the system now has it that the vast majority of educators are then trying to make that person non-autistic. And that's impossible for that person. And that is just so devastating because so many of the systems within the system, the classroom systems and the reward systems, and this is how we do things. And this is how we move within the classroom. And this is the sensory environment, all of it, all packed into a day of trying to make you, this child fit in as a non-autistic child. And that's impossible. And so th that child and those children are set up to fail before they even start within the system and, and that's devastating making kids non-autistic because that sounds yeah. horrific and people are like no we're not trying to do that at all because it sounds like we're trying you know but things like demanding eye contact uh, expecting yeah. eye contact and not accepting an autistic kid may not make eye contact because it hurts them teaching yeah. autistic children social skills uh having social goals in their ieps having things yeah. like must you must say hello to three friends this week in the yard any of that rubbish um shouldn't be have anything to do with autistic children because that is actually teaching them the way they're beat their way they way our way of existing is wrong and you must be this other person um expecting a child who can't sit still to sit still expecting um a child who is direct and blunt to not be direct and blunt uh you know expecting a child who um finds lights too bright and sounds too buzzy to cope to learn to cope with that if i had feet if i put on a sound now you know that awful sound that feedback from microphones and amplifiers and stuff like that you know when you're in a, at a gig or in a, at a talk and there's that screech and everyone's like Ugh! you couldn't expect everyone in the audience to cope with that and learn how to cope with that noise you accept that, that noise is actually hurting someone's ears we're not doing that a lot of the time with autistic kids some people and some people you know some people think um that it's something that we can learn to cope with or that if we have something to play with we can you know cope with that so um just kind of just to elaborate a little bit on, on that Siobhan you know and also I suppose it's important mm. at this point to say yeah the system's totally broken for lots of kids but there are schools and there are wonderful teachers. I think it's important yeah. to say they're wonderful teachers, wonderful SNAs. I've met loads of them who've come to our courses, who, you know what I mean, bought our books, all that kind of stuff, who really, really want to do what's right and who who are work getting it right within the broken system. So I suppose, you know, while we're kind of highlighting all the things that are wrong, it's important to say that yes, there are yeah. pockets of people who are getting it right because they have the right information, because they know what the right thing to do is. Um, yeah. So we're moving on now from giving out, are we? <laughs> um, yeah, and I think I think you know this possibly this sensory environment is one that we can all look at maybe immediately. Um, and you know there are things that we can do right here now tomorrow morning that can make make that big difference. And and that it, that's a huge part of an autistic person's day um, within a school building because even a small school I am in a big school and it, it's very very busy there are bright I'm not talking about my school I'm just talking about all schools in general now but you know there are bright lights and um, bright lights hurt um, you know bright lights make noise the, the the senses all get mixed up in and I was talking to a teacher about this recently and they said but nobody was talking at the time and the and child had their hands on their ears going it's too loud and I was saying but lights can be too loud and 
um, you know, smells can be too loud because it all gets so mixed up in this massive sense of overwhelm of sensory overload. And our schools, they are overloaded with, what, what I've been saying is, I have the luxury of being able to dim my lights in my classroom. It makes a massive difference. Not every school has that luxury, but things like if we could turn some of the lights off or down, that makes a massive difference from the starting point at quarter to nine in the morning for our children. Bright, bright, overloaded um, Pinterest classrooms just prevent a lot of autistic children from learning. Um, it's very difficult for an autistic child to be sitting in a classroom with the bright lights and all of the colors and the different bright colors and posters and everything on the wall to even be able to see a teacher through that. Never mind here then. Um, and follow instruction and, and, and try to learn. So I, I really would think if I, if I could say to people look at your sensory environment within the classroom and see is there stuff that you can take down do you need that much stuff do we need all of the different colors because that's something that we can do straight away and that will make a massive massive difference um to the autistic children um lines walking in lines and corridors this, these are other things that we can really look at and see and i and, and and we say this all the time, not every autistic child is going to find every every classroom the same and it's the same as all children. But, you know, to make a difference, we have to talk quite generally and not all autistic children are going to hate lining up, but some, a lot of autistic children won't be able to do it. There's smells and noises and touch and bright lights in the corridor and all of those things. And we can look at different things like. Could we perhaps, could you bring your whole class out earlier? Could some, some children maybe ask, talk to the children, ask them what their needs are. Say that again, Siobhan, say it loud. Talk what? to the children. We forget them, to ask yeah. children what their needs are. Yeah. Now they may not know all of their needs and this is another big part of this and this all connects into building relationships within the classroom over the compliance and uh, reward systems and stuff and getting to know children. I mean, you know, our children aren't going to be able to say, uh, sorry, can you turn the lights on? I find that too bright and there's far too much going on in the classroom. But but we can start the conversations with them, ask them, do you like the line? Is there anything about the line? Would you prefer to be in the front or back? Huge amount of, 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 of what we need to do within the classroom is building up that safe place for them where we can guide them through becoming aware of their sensory environment, becoming aware of what they like and what they don't like. Because, you know, I'm only starting to learn that now. And, and, and so these are children because quite often, and this is where it links in with behavior, quite often as grown adults, autistic or not, it doesn't matter. We get ourselves into this position where like, oh my God, everything's too loud. And too, can you just all shush there in the background, please? And I've had a busy day and uh, trying to cook the dinner and there's dogs barking. And we can, we, we all have those moments. And so the reality is that those moments are happening to our autistic children a lot during the day and for things that we might not see and we might not hear. And by the time we recognize it, we're talking about challenging behavior, demanding behavior, bad behavior, and all, and, and all that. And so then what becomes apparent is, oh my God, we've got to fix this behavior and this behavior doesn't fit in and we don't like this behavior. And it's I really about looking on the inside, isn't it? It's really about looking keys, deeper. I think one of the keys for um, working with children and something that like, remember somebody said it to me years and years ago, is that there is no such thing as bad behavior. Now I was obviously raised like many of us thinking that we had bad behavior and good behavior and that's what behavior was. That was my understanding of behavior basically. And I know a lot of us as teachers or you know, working with children are trained in that kind of thinking. Once yeah. we leave that park that over here and say, forget about it. And it takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of time to work through those. The, literally we've been brought up with that. So I'm 40 odd. I've had that many years of you know conditioning. Uh, leave it there think about it and say right can we look at behavior as something different and if you start seeing behavior as a way of communicating what's going on inside okay and think you know and then start to think why is this child doing this what need is being unmet what is you know what is what is distressing them you get a very different understanding and you start to as you said build a very different relationship with that child rather than 
having a reward chart and something that's there to make this child do stuff they just can't do or to pretend they can you know to cope with the thing um you know one of the examples i use quite often is winning and losing because i know that's a big thing for some yeah. kids in schools it comes up really often it came up with kids i taught you know and um to explain to people autistic children are not like top popular mr or mrs popular in their classes usually right they're very often ostracized by their peers they're very often uh, on their own they're very often not asked to birthday parties again not always but yes very often we have a kids program that we do in confident kids same stories as the adults in our community are sharing from their school days we are often bullied all of that kind of stuff right we're, you know, made to feel different, let's say. Losing a game in front of your peers when you're one of the lads or, you know, one of the gang uh, is not the same as losing a game in front of somebody when you already feel othered, different and less than the group. A child is not, you know, responding to losing the game. They're responding to losing the game and all of that rejection. And I think that's something that we haven't mentioned so is, is the amount of rejection social rejection that an autistic person faces there's no research on mm. how much okay <laughs> we all know from our own experiences it hurts us every time we're rejected we're sensitive people anyway and when you're rejected whether that's um you know being rejected you know i don't want to be your friend today or no you can't come to my house or not being invited to play dates or people not coming to your play dates or whether that's somebody rejecting you as you by demanding eye contact, by expecting you to communicate in neuroconformative ways, um, you know, uh, that's also a way of rejecting an autistic person. And then we end up, I suppose, masking all of that and pretending we're okay when we're really, really not. Um, so we, you know, yes, absolutely. We can make changes tomorrow, our sensory environment, like dimmer switches. I have dimmer switches in every room in my house. Yeah. <laughs> like literally, we don't even turn on the lights half the time. There's lamps. Like lighting is probably one of the most, I think, important things. Yeah. When I organized our conference a few years ago in Cork, that was the like thing that I paid the most attention to because you can't do everything. You know what I mean? You can't. But like you try and pick the you know biggest things. You talk to the people you see, you know, kids in your class, you see what you can do, work around them. You notice how they respond to stuff as well. You can't, yeah. this is the thing, you know, we, um, I know you said this to me the last time we talked, you know, um, I'm always talking about like tuning into that child and tuning into their, what they do, whether it's their, you know, actions or stims or whatever, you can read them, you know? I mean, you actually just get to read a kid and you'll get to see if something's upsetting them before you know, before it gets to up to here, up to 10. Because that idea that autistic children go from naught to 10 yeah. isn't correct. There's always early signs. And what's happening is people are missing the early signs. We do express ourselves slightly differently. Our body movements can be different. It can look different to non-autistic people. So maybe people don't recognize a stim that's showing distress or a facial expression that's showing distress or someone biting their lip or a distraction or something. But, you know, if you spend enough time and you spend enough, um, and I suppose this is the problem, <laughs> this is the problem, yeah. curriculum is here and the child's here. So we're actually like creating environments, which is horrible for teachers, people who want to go in and, and SNAs, people who want to go into schools to work with children, but they're getting very little time to work with children and get to know the children. And yeah, but, but the, 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 and this, this takes a little bit of time at the start. But once you do this and once you do all of those things and look at the environment and look at the children and look at their stims and allow them to stim and move and get to know them and build those relationships and create a safe place for them to be themselves, then you will find you will have way more time for the curriculum anyway. I mean, that is the, the truth. You know, and it, it, it is worth it is worth putting a little bit of time and effort in the start. Everybody is happier. But I think it's really important there what we were talking about, because the one of the parts of the article and I connect all this back in um, was that um, somebody took a STEM toy off a child as a punishment. Um, I have three STEM toys in my hand right now and four or five over here because I didn't know how this was going to go and it being live. Well, I need different ones and stuff. And for, I mean, it was a primary school child and, um, you know, stimming is so important to everybody. Human being. But it, it, you know, you say this all the time, I mean, you know, we click our fingers and we pace and we tap and we're stressed and we're awaiting our exam results, we pace up and down. And 
but maybe not as much as often as autistic people do. So, and yet we we find maybe a bit uncomfortable or it's annoying the rest of the class or whatever, all of these things that we have. Um, but autistic children need to do this. Um, and pacing up and down the side of the classroom does not mean that they're only just pacing up and down the side of the classroom. They're working through the emotional stuff that's going on inside. They might be using it to focus and concentrate and they will be listening to the story that you're telling no matter where you are within the classroom, because that's just a different way of listening. And so really, not only should we never take stim toys, fidget things, whatever we want to call them off to them, because I mean that, and then give them back when they change their behavior. That's like taking their, their lunch off them and telling them they can have their lunch back. We are one. Like, it's just not acceptable. But we I should mean, be it's, encouraging it's it. We should... Anyway, like, I mean, see, because that's the thing in the article is that, you know, it's like taking, you know, someone's, you know, something, some aid anybody needs, right? But it's like, but also children have autonomy and our school system is set up. And like, if you're in a school and you're taking things off kids, confiscating stuff, don't do it. That is telling a child that an adult has the right to take something off them without their permission. That's not okay. That's not an okay message to send a small child because children should be entitled to say no and they should be entitled to their belongings and their autonomy. So those things that we're doing to children mm -hmm. is messing them up. It's basically, you know, grooming them for to say yes to people. It's grooming them to just let people take whatever they want from them now and later on in life. You know, we really need to look at the psychology behind the things that we're doing. They're not just OK. And it's not just I'll just take that off Johnny now and then Johnny will sit quiet and behave himself. It's actually like, what's Johnny learning when an adult does that? Johnny's learning mm -hmm. that they're not in power. You know, there's an awful lot more to it. And if people are interested, in more like Alfie Cohn is, is amazing talk about kind of the you know why rewards are actual punishments you know uh why we should not be using them at all at all at all <laughs> like never mind in schools at all on children or each other anything like that um so i mean that's a hard one that's a hard one for people to change um it's it's you know it, it's letting go of control um because that's what it is um and um you know i have had people say but but how do you get them to do this? That if you don't have controls on, you know, I can understand that there's a, that, you know, it's the way we went through school. It's, it's a lot of what, um, look at it, you know, it all ties back into big class sizes and overloaded curriculum and stuff. And maybe I'm being too kind there, but anyway, it's, it's not only is it wrong, and we could talk four hours on, on, on rewards and um, the shame that comes with them and posting them publicly, um, within classroom and point systems and that for, for them to be there if it's not there all the time it flashes up on a screen and for a child to be reminded I'm a failure at that I can't do that I didn't manage to do that and if the child isn't doing the things that you want them to do then they can't or something within the classroom and the environment or within them at that time means that they can't do it right there and then um, and rewarding points or things or stars or whatever isn't going to change that. It's not going to make the child want to do it. And on top of that, it's worse for autistic children. It's harder for autistic children because usually what we reward is neurotypical behavior. And so things like, and you know, like I'm passionate about this changing within our classrooms, things like good sitting, good listening, good... <laughs> Oh, quiet eyes on teacher, feet on floor. Eyes on teacher, all of those things. And I really genuinely believe, I mean, most people don't think that there's anything wrong with that. But if we listen to why it is, you know, and maybe start looking a bit more into it ourselves, really well, it is quite it damaging. Back to autonomy number one, why yeah. are you telling a child what to do with their body? You know what I mean? Why are we obsessed with, I'm not telling you, Siobhan, you sit there now and talk to me with your hands on your lap and your feet on the floor. Because yeah. also... So there's the autonomy thing, which is the most important. We're not we're yeah. not teaching children to respect their own boundaries, okay? Um, and then you have the ridiculous idea that if you move, you can't learn. Yeah. <laughs> In most instances, we actually learn better when we're mm. moving. Uh, you know, people can drive a car and listen to the radio. You can run a marathon and listen to a podcast. You can have a conversation with somebody while riding a bike. You can move and learn at the same time. And a lot autistics are amazing at stimming and, and that's how I actually we learn stuff. You know, I mean, it's literally, and it, the way I'm moving my hands now, I'm doing this mm -hmm. when I was looking for a word and I'm explaining stuff. And stimming actually shows what's going on inside the person, you know, so we can look at bod autistic body language in that way. And it will really explain 
okay, so, you know, why is this kid moving their hands? They're literally showing you what's going on inside them. You know what I mean? It's like, if someone's going like this, I'm so excited. You know, if I'll often do things like this, where I'm like searching for the word in the file of facts in my brain while I'm talking. Um, uh, we have a comment here at a recent meeting with SEN and teacher. I was asked how to get, I just won't name her daughter, my daughter to do things she doesn't want to do in the classroom. Whoa. And that I think that's it too, Siobhan. You said something there like, yeah. how do we how do get, I get them? them to? Like, that's a really problematic phrase. How do I get? So if we, if we yeah. say, how would I get my wife to do something she doesn't want to do? How would I get my husband to do something they don't want to do? What people would be like, well, I'm sure people do have those conversations and think it's okay. Well, we don't. <laughs> uh, you know, put it in context. Put, you know, sometimes we talk about children and if you change it to an adult scenario, you'll see like how, actually, yeah. oh my God, like that's actually awful. And I love your response, you know, because you responded, you don't, you don't get someone to do something they don't want to do. There's a reason why someone doesn't want to do something. Maybe yeah. it's too hard. That's Maybe the point. Explain it properly maybe you're not giving them the right motivation maybe they don't see a point to doing it because there's not a lot of points sometimes and if a teacher can't explain the points to you know why we're doing this then how is a child supposed to be motivated because we are very much intrinsically motivated as autistic people um you know we love learning when it's when we're interested in the thing um so make it interesting. and that that just no sorry <laughs> but that crosses over beautifully into into what's happening as well and the way autistic people learn and you know back again to what we we're saying the neurotypical way we don't learn the same ways that neurotypical children do and so you know whether we're rewarding them or not or trying to get them to do that if it's not their way of learning well then they're not going to learn um and w like we see this a lot in, in in schools and um you know say the quick 20 minute half an hour lessons in primary schools and maybe even secondary schools as well with the, with the class periods the way they work and the jumping from one thing okay we're doing maths now and 30 minutes later okay we're doing phonics and then we're doing reading and that can be extremely difficult for an autistic learner because we can tend to get really focused on, you know, if I'm doing maths or it doesn't matter what it is and I'm big into it. I want to stay at it for an hour, an hour and a half, you know, and I'm loving it and I'm, I'm getting out of it. And, and, and for a teacher all of a sudden to say, okay, you're done that what you're really um, into and we are all oh, that huge, massive, fabulous, positive learning experience. We're, we're stopping that because it's now phonics. That's that even to transition from that to move on from that is so difficult. Never mind to take them away from that deep state of true learning. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I don't know the, the, the details of, of, of what was happening with that child, but you know, there's just so much happening here. Um, you know, autistic, autistic people, ch children quite often want to te teach themselves how to, how to learn. They want to go and get the books themselves and look this look stuff up and you know that doesn't fit in with a typical timetable of a day no matter what school they go but you know what that's okay because it works and if it works for that children and that these kids are telling us and again they may tell us through frustration they may, and you know, buying a book or rip a page or whatever but that has got to the point where you know they're so frustrated with what is happening around them um, within the whole system that yeah, yeah. Okay. you i mean you raised some brilliant points there because it, it you know it's um without uh praising you <laughs> giving you all the reinforcement i'll take it back <laughs> five stars five stars <laughs> five stars for you um yeah autistic children it is almost impossible to make a brain an autistic brain well anyone really interested <laughs> in something they're not interested in okay we're very, you know, because we're sensitive people and our senses are obviously linked very strongly with our emotions, we're very emotional people. So we're kind of driven by our emotions. So if we are really involved in learning something, we're loving it, we're completely connected to that thing and that moment, but there's harmony in that. If you try and pull a child out of that, you're literally disrupting that whole world that there's just been, you know, created around this learning. And you're trying to pull a kid out of it. I don't mean physically, I, well, I mean, it feels physical to them, but you're like, yeah. as you said, oh, time up onto something else. 
doesn't even matter if you give me five minutes warning as such those things kind of work sometimes but if you're demand avoidant that would actually trigger me i'd be like stressed off my head if i only knew i had five minutes to do the thing time is like a, my one big massive trigger so i'd feel under massive pressure and i wouldn't be able to even do the thing in the first place so but trying to give someone like this transitioning time for autistics just let them finish the thing i get really frustrated if i had to leave something like lots of people do it's like leaving your you know, cupboard kitchen presses open while you're sitting down having your dinner. I'm sure I'm not the only one that annoys. That's like, they have to be closed. You know, there's little things. If I, if, you know, let's ask the audience, people here, what things bug you? You know what I mean? It's those things that are unfinished or, you know, you have to do. We all do it as human beings. We all have our little rituals, you know, that we have to do this thing first, maybe before we can do the other things. It's, you know, we can all kind of empathize with this. Um, but for autistics, it's just, I suppose, bigger, stronger. So it's like really hard for us to disengage from one thing and onto the next while we're in that kind of flow state. Ah, oh, we're getting some replies on this. Shoes not facing the same way on the rack. Yeah, it's those <laughs> things. That's it. Thank you for that one. It's those things. Come on, people, give me some more. <laughs> we all have our things that kind of like, oh, drive us nuts. And we might not be able to do the next thing until we fix the shoes on the rack. You know, it's that kind of idea. Not finishing a row of knitting. Oh yeah, imagine finishing a knitting halfway through. You know, that's really hard. It's those kind of things. It's like, you'd have to finish it and then it feels finished. Um, so it's, it's, you know, all I'm doing is trying to find kind of similarities because that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Human beings we need to empathize um, with each other. Oh, very good question there from Denise. What's your opinion on now and then? and this first and that next. I mean, I think that's kind of, again, it's not understanding why an autistic child, it's a behavioral approach, isn't it? It's kind of saying first, it's kind of saying to the child, you don't understand this, you know, what basically that this is the rules of the school. So first we're going to do that and then we're going to do that. Yes, there's thinking behind it that it simplifies things and all that kind of stuff. But like autistic children don't need to be spoken to in that way, you know. It depends if the first, so I don't use these things, but I, I, I know I know of them. It depends, is it first and then? It, it, it's really quite damaging if the first and then is first you do your maths homework and then I'll give you your STEM toy or first oh, well. you do your you write your story that happened that, that so i know there's that type of person there so first you do this and then you get to go to the sensory room first yeah. you know so I, I i i'm not sure if that's the kind of first and then it's that's, the, that, if that's the one a lot of these that's things, the one no yeah <laughs> absolutely no and no anything that's using rewards just no um no. you see and this is the thing it's it, it's like quiet hands people yeah, use that sign it's originally from aba which meant no stimming but now schools use it as a way to kind of say don't hit people but again like a child doesn't hit just because no one told them not to hit a child hits like anybody else out of frustration you know what i mean it's like there's too much emotion going on they're literally just overwhelmed and frustrated so putting a sign on the wall saying no hitting i'm actually kind of solving the problem like oh gee look it's like saying calm down you know okay oh, yeah. yeah so it's the same kind of idea and i think it's kind of not fully kind of dealing with the fact that the child just needs to finish their thing and needs to transition in their own time. You're still kind of forcing that expectation on them that you do this thing first and then you move to the next thing. Now, it might be helpful for someone to you know, know that this is first and then we're going to do this later on and all that kind of stuff. But again, autistic children need schedules because of anxiety, not because of autism, again. Um, someone, oh, Lauren is saying, not putting things in the same place in the press. <laughs> You see, we all have our things, and I bet you know, think about them later on and think about like if you weren't allowed, fix the thing that was annoying you, and then we're expected to continue and have a conversation with someone or perform or do whatever you know it is to do. Um, the, the, I suppose you know, we, we uh, you mentioned at the beginning, Siobhan, that like there's lots of courses that are like by the NCSC and EPV and all that kind of stuff. And this is the problem. I suppose just to explain to people here, like what we're talking about, why this is a problem, is that basically the autistic community were omitted from research for 100, almost 100 years. They researched parents, or aunties, or grannies, or uncles, or aunts, or doctors, or nurses, or dentists, and never actually asked autistic people for input. 
So what we have in the past decade really is like a massive shift where professionals are actually, you know, neuro affirming professionals, professionals who are respectful towards autistic people are including autistic people in their research or being led by autistic people. And you also have autistic professionals and researchers who are doing the research that the autistic community actually needs. So there's this massive paradigm shift that's happening at the moment. It's not getting to you, people who, you know, fast enough, yeah. um, I suppose, which is one of the reasons why I set up awesome training. It's literally like, we can't wait for the system. It's going to be 20, 30 years. How many more kids are going to be traumatized by it? We need the information. We need to get it to people today. Um, you know, even people, and this is like we had in May, that awful, terrible practice guide was released. You know, it's called the Good Practice Guide for Autism or whatever it is in our schools, released by the NCSE and NEPS. And it contains behaviorist, it contains all sorts of nonsense about autistic children lacking social skills, it includes social skills training, all the things that should be gone now. And like, there is no excuse for something like that to be produced in 2022 because we live in an age of information. Siobhan, you knew nothing about autism until you two years ago. I knew nothing really either till eight years ago. We went away, we educated ourselves, we found the information, we found the right people, you know, and we taught ourselves. So why people are producing these kind of things that are actually not okay is, is beyond me. And then you have schools who think they're doing the very best following this yeah. right? So like, we do have, just to put it in context for people, like. It's highly problematic, like what's going on within a system. And I suppose that was produced by a system where people are ticking boxes. Oh, we need to produce a thing on autism. Okay, throw some stuff together, you know what I mean? And put it out there and, and clap ourselves in the back. Now that's done without actually including autistic. They actually left out autistic researchers um, research out of it as well, which was and theories and put in a whole load of outdated stuff, you know, like Baron Cohen is in there and I think monotropism wasn't in there. I think they did put uh, double empathy in there by Damien Milton. They mentioned it and then totally contradicted it later on with their strategies, you know, so this is kind of this fake thing that's happening as well, where we have people who who were using words like neurodiversity um, to give an example, actually, so I put it up on our social media during the week was um, there was a, I don't know, a preschool autism teacher or something on Instagram, I was looking at her stuff and she had, you know, autistic children play differently and that's okay. People play in different ways. Here are strategies, you know. Change it. Change To make it better? To make, to make it, it better? Change ah. autistic children. Well, she didn't use those words. Here are strategies, but this is, and this is important for people to be aware of. Here are strategies for you to expand your autistic child's play. You just said there's nothing wrong with it. Why are you trying to expand it? Which means change it and develop it. And play has a, is play and play has its own functions and children will play in the way that they need to play. We don't need to be inter interrupting their play or, or, or interfering with it at all, ever. Um, you know, but it's that. So you've got the people who know aren't even, aren't on the neurodiversity train yet. And then you're the people who, who've one foot on it, <laughs> you know, kind of going, yeah, I'm saying the right stuff, but I'm still doing the wrong things. And I understand it takes a while. It took me a while, you know? We're not pretending this is easy. This conditioning and this thinking runs very deep and this discrimination yeah. against autistic people runs very, very deep in our culture. It takes time to work through these things. For me, for a while, my theory wasn't matching, you know, my actual, you know, stuff I was producing, let's say, or, you know, things like that. So it's like, it actually takes time to do this. We totally understand that. But it's just people need the opportunity to do it, really. And I don't think people are getting the opportunity because they're literally getting a whole lot of bad information and awful training, you know. Um, yeah. Can I just say this? It's something I thought of there when you were talking about that. Um, I, well, I thought of 10 things, but I was trying to remember. I think things to watch out for, because I'm assuming, you know, the parents and essays teachers here, and I think it's really important to say that quite often within a school, um, when we're looking at what we can do and help and our artistic children one of the first things that we do is say okay social skills classes and we'll take them out and we'll take them in small groups and we'll take two or three kids with them and we'll teach them social skills and and this is really really problematic um and difficult for artistic children um because quite often we, we already feel that we're not part of what's going on anyway because it doesn't suit us and it doesn't suit our way and there's this massive mismatch between what we and you know we 
inside we feel we need and is not we're not getting that within the school system for all of a lot of reasons we spoke about but then so we're giving them the messages well I can't sit still and I can't stim and I, I, I can't make eye contact I can't do all of those things that I want to so now I'm going to take you out and teach you teach up uh, did I lose you there no, no, no. something happened um you know and now I'm going to take you out and teach you how to do it the way all of the other children in the class are doing it and that's not what autistic children need <laughs> they don't need to be taught the social skills of the other children in the class and we and, and I on I think I would if I don't even have looked that deep to think that I would have thought that before and think it's really great um because they're playing such and such on the yard and if we don't know that that's exactly what the autistic child needs we can't be ticking our own box of success the success of what the child needs from a social point of view must always come from their needs and their autistic needs and the way that they are and not we, the way we assume and so if we see an autistic child on their own in the yard we can think oh look they're on their own they need this we have absolutely no idea from just seeing a child on their own what they need and it's back to all of what we talked about before building relationships and trying to you know talk to a child listen to a child and and and, and between all of the above trying to see what is is there something missing is there something that that child needs? is there something as a school we can do is the is is it that the yard is too noisy and too busy is it that they desperately want to play with other children but maybe in a different area or maybe they want to sit on a bench or maybe they'd love to play with a child on a climbing frame or there are so many different options here but to bring them into a classroom with two other children three times a week and say this is how you play neurotypically is not really the answer and I, I, I it might be more difficult to spot but but I think if as an educator or a parent here who maybe is considering what's happening within the school if if we look at it, what we really want to do and everything you talk about this much more beautifully than me is um to educate autistic children about what it is to be autistic to educate non-autistic children what it is to be autistic to, and the other way around so that everybody knows what it is like for and and, and that is the answer i mean that is that include is the answer it really is and th this this is a, i think Evelyn, you call it meeting meeting in the middle and we, we our system and our education system we're not meeting in the middle at all we're kind of pulling the autistic children over to the to the neurotypical side at the whole time and this it won't work within our classroom systems it won't work from relational points of view and social and um, interactions and emotional point of view and sensory point of view unless we work with all of our children to look at all of the different languages and cultures and sensory experience and emotional experience and social experiences it won't work without that and 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 that sounds simple. Um, I, I, I don't know if it does to, to, to other people, but there's a lot missing um, in that, what I've just talked about, for all of our children. And because to expect any, any of our child to understand the way it is for another child without doing work on that is just not going to, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen naturally. Just throw everybody out in the yard together and ex expect it, it, it all to happen. And it's not. And so, we, we just need, I think, to keep an eye out for those social skills training. Yeah, I mean, to briefly explain, uh, yeah, there was a theory that autistic people lack social skills. No, we don't. Uh, it was never researched until three years ago. And when they researched it, they actually found autistic people are really good communicators. As you can see, myself and Siobhan talking to each other here tonight, perfectly fine, without anybody teaching us or getting translating for us. The difference is non-autistic people and other non-autistic people communicate just fine with each other, but we have different communication styles, autistics and non-autistics. So when we mix the group, we have different, we misinterpret each other. And more often than not, autistic people are misinterpreted. There's loads of reasons for that. I recently wrote a blog, it's on our website about processing autistic prejudice. I do have a read of it, it explains kind of what I'm talking about in, in, in a lot of detail. Um, but we know from our own experiences, Siobhan, we know from the children we work with, 
Um, as I said, we have a kids program where we have autistic kids coming. Um, you know, it's not, we call it a social program, but that's to kind of attract people. <laughs> it's, it's about teaching kids self-advocacy skills. It's about teaching kids how to deal with exclusion, okay? Which isn't funny, mm -hmm. but it's nice, kind of. Um, you know, that's as much as you can teach someone to do that. Um, you can, you know, kind of guide them and support them and they meet other autistic kids and find support there. But um, literally because of the exclusion that autistic children face in our schools. Myself and Orla, who she runs our, our program in Confident Kids, you know, we were like, what, what are we going to do about this? And we just, you know, we're, we're both drama teachers. We've worked, I've taught for 20 years or Orla's taught for almost 10 or whatever. Um, I actually taught her <laughs> three years, so it's kind of cool. Um, but we wrote include because actually the solutions are quite simple. Mm -hmm. Autism has been complicated and mystified into this strange thing. We're human beings, you know, we're pretty, you know, we, we do the same things as other human beings in very human ways. We're just more sensitive. Take away all the rubbish, all the nonsense, all the trauma responses, all the anxiety that the world causes us because it doesn't understand us and people haven't been educated on us properly, let's say. Um, take away all that and you're left with sensitive people. Mm -hmm. that, that's who we are. And where's the space for the sensitive child in, in our system? You know, we think sensitive is a bad thing. And we go, oh, they're too sensitive. In all sorts of ways, we can see sensitivity as a bad thing. We need sensitive people in the world. We need probably more sensitive people in the world right now when you look at the state of it. So understanding what it means to actually be autistic, you know, when you take away all the other stuff is actually, yeah, yeah. sensitive people. That's it. If you understand, and it is literally that simple. And if you understand yeah. that, that's literally, you know, take that away from tonight. But if you want to do something in your schools socially, because yeah, we can, you know, fiddle around with lights, we can change sensory, you know, environment. But other people are a huge part of our sensory system, our sensory yeah. environment. So the way people respond to us socially is massive. And I talked about social rejection earlier on. I talked about like the negative things that autistic people experience, right? We don't want we don't need to be experiencing them let's change the social environment in a school um we you know we made this for primary schools we're working on our include two for secondary schools and um, should be out in a, in a couple of months but it's 10 lesson plans that you do like you talk to children about race or religions or you know tolerance that awful word tolerance <laughs> like accepting other people that's all this program does it talks about we all have sensory needs every human being has sensory needs not autistic aren't even weird sensory creatures like everyone's sensory <laughs> so you know we need to look at whose sensory needs are being met in a school it's usually the adults the quiet class you know no noise shh, sit down wear the uniform so you all look the same don't be distracting sensory needs of the adults are being met in a school and sensory needs of children who need quiet are being met what about the kids who need to run around what about their sensory needs what about you know so it's not just autistic people with sensory needs we need to start understanding that and stop talking about sensory this and sensory that because it just means human basically and uh, related to sensory system so we all have it we've written 10 beautiful lesson plans which guide you because it is hard and the language is hard yeah you are kind of afraid sometimes how do i bring this up and you have maybe parents in the school who aren't comfortable about you talking about autism and all of that so we've just left it out we literally there's two scripts that there's one script where we talk about an autistic autistic characters and whatever the rest of the lesson plans are actually talking about and not just autistic kids neurodiversity so people who are autistic people who are dyspraxic dyslexic down syndrome whatever you know just different in some way with our neurology and how we need to be more inclusive and what it feels like to be left out and what it feels like to leave people out and we can think in different ways and we learn in different ways and we communicate in different ways and literally just talking to kids about these normal to human differences because they are normal human differences you know what i mean and that's what we do and we just demystify the whole thing and you know break those barriers that are there for autistic children because there are barriers you know that narrative mm -hmm. that whole idea of teaching autistic children i know i get it all the time how do we teach my child or how do we teach the autistic children to interact with the other children? We could say, how do we teach the other children to interact with the autistic child? Or we could say, what's stopping the children interacting with each other? And the answer is actually our prejudice, our, you know, the way autistic people are displayed are, you know, in the world, these stereotypes that are put out there. 
um, and people react to those. And as I said, read the article, it explains kind of my thinking a bit better than I am can do now in about two minutes. Um, but, you know, the solutions are simple. You don't need to go and spend 20 grand on a sensory room. You know, and I suppose that's something I mentioned earlier. It's like, why are we setting up rooms for kids to be distressed in, calm down in? Like, think about it. Take autistic, take autism out of it. If I was setting up a center for children to come and learn and play in, and I said to people, I was put in a room for the children who are distressed to calm down in. Wouldn't someone raise an eyebrow? Wouldn't someone say, well, what? why would kids be getting distressed in your, in your center? Why are you building a room for them so that they get distressed and have, can calm down? And why are you building a calm down room? Wouldn't somebody ask that question? You know, we need to start asking those questions and stop accepting, oh yeah, we just put the kids there when they, when they get too stressed. They'll calm down then. You know, and where's the research to show that that actually works for autistic children? Because in Ireland, we have none, no research on autistic kids who've been through the system. None. There's no data at all. So we're doing things without research. They're not evidence-based. Evidence They're not. You know, and we're not checking with kids who've been through the system, plenty of kids who are 18, 20, 25, who've been through to set special schools, you know, who, who've been, who's asking them, what was that like for you? Did the sensory room work? I well, didn't find out I was autistic till an adult, you know, so thank, maybe I was blessed in some ways. Um, but, you know, Jude, who I work with a lot, had the sensory room experience. And he said he just sat there and kind of knew he had to calm down and, you know, did that until he nearly saw it like a punishment. You know, it wasn't a punishment for him. It was a place for him to calm down. But he knew he couldn't go back to the class and do until he did what they, you know, to calm. He knew what it was for, you know, and kids know as well. I think it's important that we, we realize that, um, you know, so, um, you know, do use the program like include. Do come to awesome training. I'm running an SNA pro, uh, course at the end of the month. I think it's starting on the 29th, th four Thursday nights, you know. Um, there are very easy solutions out there. It starts with getting informed. It starts with getting the right information. I spent the summer putting together um, Thrive 22, which is a program for schools. It's five hours, five hours of video. And one of the parents in our Connect program bought it for her kid's school. You know, she was watching it and she messaged me and she was like, oh, Evelyn, she's like, it's just all the things I spent years as a parent learning, all kind of neatly wrapped up in, in, in five video mod modules. You know, don't tell me a school doesn't have five hours to donate to this so we don't traumatize children. You know, don't tell me. <laughs> you know, it's like we can find it. Uh, there's a parent, a talk for other parents, for all the parents of the school, because that's what we need. We need everybody on board. We don't need teachers trained. We don't just need the SNAs trained, because that's another thing that's happening. SNAs come for training all the time, all the time. Well, what's the point in having two people in the school who know what to do and everyone else contradicting them or everyone else doing something different? And what's happening, well, adults argue, is that children are suffering, you know? So we all need to be on board with these things, absolutely. Um, because autistic kids aren't doing okay in our school. You know, I know, Siobhan, you wanted to talk about masking, so maybe have a, you know, tell us about that before before we go because well i just and actually I was thinking it was it, it very i know i'm looking at the time but um we have been talking more about obvious behaviors and more external behaviors and the things that we as teachers and staff can see and um you know we talked about that a lot but there, we also have to remember that we have a lot of quiet autistic children who are sitting really really quietly and scared in our classrooms um and masking um quietly uh, in safety mode and um, putting themselves in that mode because um we maybe are not providing safe environments for those children to be themselves to feel comfortable being themselves to express themselves for who they are and internally for who they feel the essence of them as a person and their core um, and through all of the stuff that we were talking about earlier they think whoa that's not me um, this place isn't safe for me to be who I want to be. And so there are the children who don't act out and, you know, behave in the, whatever all those behaviors are talking and, and they, they sit quite quietly and they get through the day um, and they're autistic people too. Um, and it's very, very difficult for them. Um, and I suppose in the program that you're talking about, 
we look at, there's a lot of, it's about awareness and people being aware and guiding children through being aware of what's going on inside of them. And, you know, we can start off with talking about, you know, whether you're hot and cold and hungry and thirsty and, you know, that then we move on to how we're feeling, how certain things make us feel, how we react to different things. And you know, it's all, it's all of, moving away from what we externally see, that external thing of behaviors and stimming and things and thinking, the more we can get inside um, our children, autistic and not autistic, but, but yeah. it's just that it is more difficult for autistic children. Um, and to take the time to do that, we will learn more and they will open, children, children will open up and children will begin to feel safer within our schools and safer just to be themselves. Um, um, and I hope that there's a seed. I hope we planted a seed and that maybe that, um, because it is, it, you know, it doesn't have to be this way for our children. You know what? That's the thing. It doesn't have to be like this. Mm -hmm. We have just, adults have messed it all up. We have complicated it. We have gone around in circles, created systems that are just hurting kids. And it doesn't have to be like this. And while we can't change the system, we can tomorrow morning start making changes that will you know be huge for autistic children you don't need massive budgets you don't need like no. degrees to do it you literally need the right information the right people you know start you know reading what autistic people are saying what the autistic community are saying um and forget anything that's that's not autistic led and that's not neuro affirming because we just need to leave all of that stuff behind right now um and i kind of feel like in some areas, like say speech and language, we're moving ahead, like OTs all moving towards the reforming, but our schools are kind of stuck, you know, stuck still kind of in this autism. You know, I get queries about like, how could you train us how to deal with autism? And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> no, because <laughs> you don't yeah. deal with autism. You're teaching an autistic child. You know, you're not dealing with a thing that somebody has that, you know, makes them do all this stuff magically. You are dealing with an autistic child who's highly stressed. And, you know, if, we're not talking, you know, I mean, most of our training involves explaining trauma to people, we, you know, and it has to be trauma yeah. informed. And if, you know, people are kind of talking about impairments and, and lacking social skills and, and repetitive movements and, and all of that kind of stuff, they don't know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? And if people are saying stimming is for emotional regulation, that's about the most basic definition you can get. This stimming has at least eight functions for, for human beings, again. And if people are talking about this stuff like it's autistic stuff instead of human, forget it. You know, I mean, they're the red flags I think we need to start looking out for. And anybody using behavioral approaches on autistic kids or any other kids, really, we need to start leaving that behind. And we are. There's a mass, again, a mind a paradigm shift. You know, it's like, oh, we did a whole lot of bad psychology there. Let's move away from that now, you know, and let's start, you know, because now we have newer science that's any on people who are kind of more informed, who are, you know, kind of looking at the negative effects of these things on, on people. Um, and I suppose just doing better, because when we know more, we can, you know, well, what is it? When we know better, we can do better. And that's all I suppose that we're asking people to do. Um, I'd love to know what people took away from tonight. If you have time just before we finish up to kind of pop a comment in, maybe just like one thing maybe that you learned or one thing that you'll take away with you. Um, I'd love to- Or maybe know something you, need, you would like to know more about. Oh yeah, that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> something you'd like to know more about we'd love to know that no maybe uh, something that came up tonight more than than something we didn't mention do you know that not necessarily something we didn't talk about but even something that we talked about tonight because we can only do so much in an hour but if there's you know yeah it'd I mean, be interesting to know what people want to find out more about and absolutely. learn more about yeah yeah we found interesting and we did touch on a lot of things tonight yeah um <laughs> You know, but uh, and you know, and I suppose it is just we don't expect people to come to something for an hour and kind of, you know, come away with understanding everything we talked about. Her. And it does take time. It does, but it's just yeah. like planting, planting those seeds. Um, you know, so um, let us know if you had a seed planted tonight. <laughs> you know, and I loved that earlier. You know, I think that's you know when when um, that commenter was asked. Um, you know, how do I get the child to do the thing that I want to do? Just don't. They're the kind of things we need to start saying. We need to start going, yeah. why, are we, why Why are we trying to get children to do stuff they don't want to do? You know, 
what's this about? And look at it, because we talk about children wanting control. Look at the arrows. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much. Absolutely great. Uh, made so much sense. Well, Siobhan was worried a bit too. <laughs> oh, it's totally oh, worried that I wouldn't make sense. <laughs> so Siobhan, as I told you, you're autistic. We can't help it. <laughs> <I just>, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Davidson, thank you for tonight. My gut feelings on so many aspects of school experience for autistic kids have been echoed here. Things need to change. You know what, David? This is what comes up most of the time when we start talking about this stuff, people start talking about their instincts. And I always feel like we're disempowered, we're kind of disconnected from our instincts because of all this information and all the stuff that's out there and there's experts and everything. And actually, if we just kind of tune into our own instincts and trust ourselves yeah. um, a bit more, I think we'd do a lot better. So um, I, I, yeah, I, I love hearing that. Um, obviously not that things need to change, but that you, you know, you, you're trusting your gut. Um, Cause I think if we all develop, yeah. we'd be better off um sensory rooms are welcome for all students not just autistic students and that's why you know if someone needs a room to go in and chill out or needs space time to themselves you know have that in a school have it like some schools have beautiful zen gardens our local library actually is a beautiful kind of zen garden and you know have those things you also don't need to spend fl flashy i mean siobhan would you go into a room with flashy lights or, no i wouldn't even know our bright colors like think about it we're humans we're sensitive most of the time, we're trying to get away from sensory input. A room where we can decompress would be kind of neutral colors and calming and relaxing, not like brightly colored with loads of stuff to stimulate us. You know, so a lot of sensory rooms don't do what they should be doing either. Um, thank you. This was very informative. I would like to know practical strategies for self-advocacy for kids in school around different situations since environments yeah. are going to change slowly. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a big thing, helping children to advocate. Well, I mean, also working with adults to listen to children, because a lot of the time children do advocate. Yeah. I mean, throwing a chair across the classroom is advocating for yourself, you see? But we don't, we see that as bad behavior. It's not the best way to advocate for yourself, probably. You know, you get in trouble, but that's self-advocacy. That's saying no, that's saying something's wrong. So also tuning into the way kids are already advocating would yeah. coincide with that, I think. Um, Niall is saying a takeaway is for sure that the things we implement with our students start with the thinking of the adult, whether the student has autism or not, and decisions make a lasting impact. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we have something in the q and I'm recently qualified SNA. I've done a lot of CPD, Zoom courses about autism, Down syndrome, et cetera, and you have debunked nearly everything I have taught. I know, sorry, I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> delighted absolutely delighted you've made yeah. so much sense we do that a lot too as autistic mm -hmm. sense. there was always a question in my mind about a lot of what i was taught and i get that listen when yeah. i started this thing i was going and i hear people saying oh and they're hypo and hypersensitive and i was like what is this and anything that didn't make sense to me in the beginning actually i'm like oh sure, no wonder it's nonsense or you know what i mean it's just human stuff in general so um it's good and trust your gut i think that's from those two comments alone yeah and start questioning stuff. Start questioning stuff. Um, we better finish up. We went a little bit over. We got a bit passionate about stuff. Um, Siobhan, it's been brilliant talking to you. I absolutely loved it. Thank you so much for doing this. Hopefully I can convince you to do some more. Um, I know, honestly, and just a few comments at the end, you know, if, if, if we're making a difference for two or three people, you know, that's enough. It's really enough. Um, and we have to do this for our children. We just have to. And it's you know it's exciting this is where small changes can happen and small changes become big ones and yeah it was great um yeah yeah thanks Maybe. for having me oh no it's been brilliant thank you so much for coming along thank you everybody for your lovely comments and the takeaways and for listening to us for the hour um oh thanks trish very informative lovely thank you so much so i'm always afraid when we've an hour how much sense you know how much can we fit in how much of it will we actually yeah rather than confusing people. So I'm glad we didn't do that. Um, thanks to everybody for, for the lovely comments. Thank you for watching and listening and see all the comments come up now and I have to read them <laughs> before I say goodbye. But um, ah, really opened my eyes. Well, yeah, thank you so much. And look, do have, we have loads of articles on the website if you want to awesome training. We have lots of information there for people, you know, um, so you can do it in your own time. Um, and hopefully myself and Siobhan will be back to have a rant about something else in a short time too. Siobhan, thank you so I'm much. Sure we will. Thanks everybody okay, for watching. Bye.
Thank you so much. Nice. Goodbye.